is there, has everyone entered or your friends are missing? No, not yet, not yet. <clears throat> right. Um, I'm going to make a start anyway because it's already eight. Um, if we start late, we're going to finish late, right? So, yeah, I'll just I'll just make a start. Um, has has this has this been is this being recorded? I hope so. Right. Okay, eight p.m. Let's do this. So nobody wants to join in. Oh, it's all right. I, 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 I can teach virtually. Right. So last week or two weeks back, you have started learning about plant growth regulators, right? So with that, um, I only taught you the first um, subtopic in plant growth regulator, which is the introduction about it, plant hormones and stuff, and also the story about oxygen. For the rest of uh, growth regulator classes, you've been asked to learn on your own and then you've been given a set of quiz questions and you've done it. So for those uh, who've done really well, congratulations. For those who are um, uh, still getting there, uh, not to worry. Uh, the answers have been provided. So this is how you can uh, do your revision. So. Um, I think this should be the um, second last topic for this semester, which is the photosynthesis. So the, the way this is going to work is um, I'm going to do the lecture uh, as usual, but you'll see that uh, the lecture that I'm going to do is actually to introduce and give you a jolt of start. Uh, to the topic of photosynthesis okay uh, oh by the way this note is in the in your folder already uh, so you can find your folder it's in your folder um, so you'll find that at slide i think number what what is it number 19 after the slide the lecture notes kind of repeating it itself not identical repetition of the previous slides but this is meant for you to do your revision okay so all the details that you like so much in the form of notes in the form of points are all in this revision section okay yeah so this the the, the only difference is uh, i'm going to uh, teach you for the first time because photosynthesis trust me you're not going to be able to grasp everything in one go the the actuality of the reality when it comes to this is um it's not going to uh, be enough just in learning in one sitting okay so this is what uh i'm doing now give it a lecture and hopefully you can do the revision afterwards with all these extra slides Right, so let's uh, uh, go on, please. You might have learned about the uh, photosynthesis, photosynthesis and respiration. I should have uh, turned it into photo uh, caps lock, everything, not the respiration. Photosynthesis. Oh. Is, is, is my voice clear? Because this mic is a bit far from me. Yeah, clear, Doctor. That's good. That's good. Right. So photosynthesis is um, kind of interrelated with the other process in the blood cell, which is the uh, cellular respiration. For photosynthesis, the organelle that you are interested with is this little green blob that is the chloroplast. While for, for, for respiration, the organelle um, in that is responsible is the mitochondria. In essence, photosynthesis 
<coughs> uses up CO2, meaning that the chloroplast sticks in CO2. While the cellular respiration, it releases CO2, right? We're not going to learn about the respiration. I just want to give you the overview of it, right? So with this concept in, um, in your mind now, throughout the day, the plant is actually doing both of these processes uh, simultaneously. The uptake of CO2 and the release of CO2 is happening throughout the day, especially during the daytime. At night, when there is no um, light to energize photosynthesis, respiration uh, dominates um, the CO2 uh, release, and that's when uh, we know that uh, sugars that has been manufactured during the day is broken down because uh, respiration is basically the breaking down of the uh, glucose molecule in order to produce the um, ATP, the energy currency. In order to properly understand photosynthesis, you need to have some kind of basic when it comes to um, leaf anatomy. I hope you still remember your lessons from botany. So this is a typical leaf cross section. This is the top of the leaf, the bottom and the side of the leaf. Then this is the cross section. These two blue pipes are the vascular bundle and the top layers of the V cells are the epidermal cell. And at the underside of the leaf, you've got the same layer of cell, except now you have these uh, specialized uh, gut cells that is known as the stoma, stoma singular, stomata plural, right? So where exactly uh, photosynthesis is happening? Photosynthesis is actually happening not in any cells, okay? These epidermal cells, they are actually not photosynthesizing. They are actually rather uh, transparent. So those that do photosynthesis cell, we call them as mesophyll cells. We got two types here. We got the palisade mesophy cell. We got the spongy mesophy cell, right? The palisade cell are the mesophy cell that look like a column and are uh, located in the upper region of the leaf, while the spongy uh, mesophy cell uh, look rather dispersed and they occupy the uh, bottom uh, side of the leaf section. Right. When you zoom in into this uh, mesophy cell, it doesn't matter, it can be the spongy mesophy cell or the palisade mesophy cell, you are going to be presented with the pathway in which the CO2 uses to get into the leaf tissue before it can actually arrive in the cell and eventually in the organelle chloroplast, right? So you can see that this here is your CO2 gets in and eventually it will arrive in your the, uh, inside of the cell, right? If we zoom in further, this is actually the uh, localization of your chloroplast. This is the cell wall. This is the cell wall bit here, plus the plasma membrane. And the truth is, chloroplast, if you can notice here, is actually pressed again. The word is pressed, R E S E D, pressed against the uh, wall of the cell. Okay, chloroplast, they don't really disperse randomly. That is the properties of uh, mitochondria, right? Why? Because they want to um, short to have the shortest uh, journey distance for the CO2 uh, to arrive in the chloroplast, right? So to give you a better view of it, you can uh, have a better appreciation by looking at this, uh, uh, the journey of the CO2. This is very important because CO2 is one of the ingredients in photosynthesis. Photosynthesis is just like any other uh, biochemical reactions. They need substrate and it happens that 
for the C uh, photosynthesis, the substrate uh, is carbon dioxide, CO2. So regardless of the, um, the textbook or the journal papers that you are using as your reference, uh, usually these are the um, common uh, symbol that we use to denote where is the CO2, which CO2 location are we talking about. So there's three locations of the CO2. When the CO2 is present outside the leaf here in this region here, that is called the CA here, ambient CO2, still in gas form. And then the CO2 will get into the leaf. You see the leaf here, there is still some air pockets Spaces, but the moment it has get gotten in, that is known as the CI, intercellular CO2 concentration. The moment the CO2 dissolve and then get into the cell, then eventually arrive in the chloroplast, it's no longer in the form of gas, but rather in liquid because CO2 can dissolve uh, in, in water. And then we call it as CC chloroplastic CO2 concentration, okay? CC, not um, cyber cafe. Chloroplastic CO2 concentration. Right, so um, it's very important to understand about the micro, or should I say the ultra anatomy of this guy here, the chloroplast. Chloroplast. Okay, you see, this is um, a typical. I can hear that um, uh, people ringing the door. Can people get in automatically, or can just somebody let them in? No, nobody can get in. I think people okay. can get in automatically. All right, all right. So that's that's good. Right. Um, sorry uh, for, 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 for that um, little uh, comment there. So this is the typical cross-section of a cell. Now we have gotten even deeper now. This is a cell you have, uh, since this is a cell wall, you've got your cell, a uh, plant cell, you've got your cell wall here, you got your vacuole, you got your nucleus, the little dense red guy core here, and then you've got the green blobs here. These are the things that you're interested with here, this thing here. So, if you do further cross-section, you'll see that chloroplast is actually, is a very busy place, okay? It's an organelle because it's got membranes, first membrane, second membrane, and now we want to get in to see what's in the chloroplast. Right. So, these are the terminologies that you need to worry about. So inside the chloroplast, you're going to find these stacking of green pancakes. Okay. Well, they are not really pancakes, actually. They, they are actually a long tube that kind of arrange in, in such a way that it appears to you that they are in a stacking form. Actually, they, they are one long tube that kind of press and fold it upon one another. So the terminology that is important here now is this one stacking here, it's called the granum, okay? The plural for that is grana. Sorry, this depends on grana, okay? Meaning that for them, for that grana. And you see the little bridges here? That is called lamella or some books um, uh, call them middle lamella. But lamella is, is actually sufficient enough. And then you have the vicinity inside the chloroplast, this vicinity here, which is outside the granule, which we call that as stroma. stroma. If your cell, plant cell, has the vicinity outside here, you can think of it like a foyer. You call it cytoplasm. So inside the chloroplast, you call it stroma. So each of these pancake in a stack of this uh, granule structure, we call them as one pancake here, we call them as talakoi, or the full name is 
Talacoid disc. What's that? One, three, pancake. Okay. And remember, this Talacoid grain has membrane. Which going, we're going to uh, see in 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 in, in uh, uh, shortly in the coming slides. So the membrane of this thylakoid is the place where you get your photosystems and uh, uh, pigments, right? And in the vicinity outside of this granum region, uh, you also you have uh, another reaction of photosynthesis, and this is actually the region that you're going to get your sugar, right? So. This is the um, very um, rudimentary, very basic equation of photosynthesis. You got um, CO2 as the substrate, then there comes water, and then there comes light. This will give result to um, glucose. This is where you get your sugar, oxygen as byproduct, and also actually you got some some water back. So what, what is actually photosynthesis is actually the combination of two biochemical reactions. So you've got the photo here, photo reaction here, and then the synthesis reaction here, right? So the photo reaction referring to the parts that's dealing in the granum region, okay? Remember the thylakoid membrane, this green guy here? Because this is the part that actually absorbs the light energy uh, in order to produce two important energy-rich molecules, namely the ATP and also the NADPH. Remember, okay, light-dependent reaction or simply light reaction, right? So we call it photoreaction, synthesis reaction. And as a byproduct, you also get oxygen, right? So th three things you get from the light reaction. ATP, and ATPH, and also the oxygen. For the uh, second part of photosynthesis is the synthesis reaction. Synthesis of what? Synthesis of sugar precursor. Right. It's it, it doesn't happen in the um, telecom membranes anymore, but rather in the stroma, in the vicinity, in the chloroplast itself. So this is commonly known as the Kelvin cycle or light independent uh, reaction. Okay, I know that some book will call this as dark reaction, but please do not um, use this terminology. Okay, dark reaction. No, because um, it, it's kind of misleading. This thing is not happening in 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 the dark, okay? It it's it needs light, but in indirectly, okay. If actually, if you learn deeper about photosynthesis, for example, if you take my uh, other uh, more advanced physiology class, you'll see that light is actually needed to activate some of the enzyme responsible in the Kelvin cycle. So to call it, that's why to call it dark reaction is actually inaccurate, right? So from the Kelvin cycle the energy molecule, the ATP, and also the reducing molecule, the NADPH, is used in order to produce the sugar precursor. This sugar precursor here, GATP, glycerol dehyde 3 phosphate, right? So let's look at the, the ingredient of photosynthesis. Number one is CO2. We all know CO2, right? Um, it's not so much, actually. Currently, it's around uh, 400 ppm in our atmosphere. When you convert that to percentage, that's not even 1%. That's only like 0.04%. It's very, very little, okay? But, but it wasn't always that way in the past. Um, in, the, in, the, in the past, you got more um, uh, CO2, actually. But since our planet flourishing and more green plants are present on the terrestrial area, area as well as the oxygen that you get from the uh, marine and oceanic uh, photosynthetic 
creatures, the amount of uh, CO2 kind of go down. Be why? Because CO2 is used in photosynthesis. If all the photosynthetic organism in the land use CO2, and those in the ocean that also use CO2, that's only logic for the CO2 to plunge in, in terms of the concentration. And that's why we get our oxygen 21%. Yeah, yeah. In the past, it wasn't always twenty-one percent. Okay, it was it was a lot lower. So thanks to plant, we have lots of oxygen, right? So um, it's it's been um, studied very very deeply um, since a long time ago. Um, the, the CO two, and it's very important for you to understand because in your context now, you look CO two as an ingredient. Uh, for photosynthesis, but when you talk about something bigger, for example, like the climate change and the global warming and stuff, CO2 is actually one of the greenhouse gases, okay? There are other uh, gases like methane, uh, nitrous oxide, and so on, but CO2 is, is definitely prevalent um, in the news, okay? And they have uh, such a big impact. Um, uh, to our planet, right? So CO two. Um, I just I just put it. This is a bit advanced, but anyway, this is good for you to know. So CO two is actually the very substance or substrate substrate that combines with a. A uh, reactant in this case is RUBP, the five carbon sugar that is all already present in the chloroplast. So CO2 plus RUBP, this is how you got your G3P, the sugar precursor. precursor. So if you think about it, the Calvin cycle kind of playing the rearranging games. Okay, because CO2, that's one carbon, RUBP is, is five carbon. If you add them together, that's six carbon, right? But G3P only three carbon. Yeah, so the story, uh, you will, you'll see in a bit. Um, so that's why CO2 uh, is, is important because without the proper addition to the five carbon, how are you going to split the carbon in this molecule, right? There, there's no such thing as 2.5 carbon molecule. Okay, it has to be even even number, right? So um, CO2 is also needed to ensure this important enzyme in the chloroplast rubisco. So, like any biochemical reaction. For plants, the most important enzyme is Rubisco. The, the problem with Rubisco enzyme is that, you'll see uh, in a bit, it's kind of not readily attracted so, to CO2, unless the CO2 is present in a large uh, quantity surrounding it. So CO2, um, although we know it as the uh, ingredient to get our sugar precursor, it's actually the activator for the photosynthetic enzyme that is uh, Rubisco. So because if Rubisco is not activated, we're not going to get our sugar and none of the life on earth would happen as it is today. Right. And, oh, sorry, I, I, I got it uh, slightly misarranged this, should be. The other, um, if you remember this equation, the other ingredient um, in photosynthesis is light. Yes, light is also the ingredient. Actually, the ingredient to in, um, energize the whole thing. So um, the thing about light is, um, I'm not going to go into deep into this, uh, but if you if you are interested in in the chat in the in the uh, YouTube channel or the playlist, there there are many lecture that I've given about light. So the thing you need to know about light, uh, because you have a bunch of students, you should know this. Light, it, you can talk about it in terms of quantity, quality, and also duration. 
for the plants to, to grow healthily, all these three need to be present in the right amount. If you get the right quantity, but not in the right quality, that's not going to happen. Okay. So what is meant by quantity? Quantity is simply the light intensity. Okay. How, how, how big or how, oh, sorry, how bright or how dim the, your, your lighting going to be. Light quality refer to the color of the light that you see with your eyes, which is the spectrum. I mean, and then duration is actually for the period. How long the light is present in a given day for the plants to experience, right? So, with that said, this this shows that light is not a linear story. It's not only one story about light because it has got this thing coming together. Right. So when we take it into perspective, the light that you understand is actually used to activate the molecule chlorophyll. Right. So you will see that whatever light that comes and then get absorbed by the plant is actually to do this one thing, to activate one special chlorophyll A that is called reaction center so that the electron uh, transport change can um, have uh, its, its effect. Okay, so when we talk about the plant pigments, because plant pigments absorb light, light energy, right? And you can see here, uh, I found it in a journal actually, there are, there are many plant pigments in plants. Right. So where are these present? These are present in on the on and also in the thylakoid membrane. Remember, you, you learned about the, the green pancake just now. Yeah. On on it and also in it. This is where you get your all of these pigments. So the pigments in plant, one thing you need to understand, they 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 are not present randomly floating about mindlessly okay they are always bound to some kind of protein uh, for example they are embedded in the telecom membrane with some protein dimers surrounding that right so they, they are very important because the light energy that gets into the plant you cannot control some energy or can be very damaging to the plant itself so these pigments acting like a sunblock uh, uh, so that they don't damage the plant, but do the actual photosynthesis. Right, so let's talk about the light reaction in plant. Light reaction. <clears throat> so this is your chloroplast, and this is your granule, and then this is the cross-section of your telecon, okay? So your thylakoid has a membrane. That's a membrane. Inside the thylakoid, there is a, a structure as well. We call it lumen. Okay. Or in some book, we call it thylakoid space. Right. Okay. So this is where the magic happens because in the membrane of the thylakoid mem uh, thylakoid mem membrane, um, there exists what we call as photosystem photosystem. There's two, photosystem two and photosystem one. Okay, so this is PS1, sorry, PS2 here, and then this is PS1. I mind you now, in sequence, the movement of energy from the light absorbed actually happens from photosystem two, then proceeds to photosystem one. Okay, it's not from one then to two. No, why? Why scientists name it this way? Why? Why didn't scientists declare for scientists didn't name this as post system one? Because of the history. Okay, uh, scientists actually found this photo system first, and then they realized some years later, um, this is not the beginning of the story. The story actually begins here for the system two, right? So what happens? So you get your light. 
your light can come in any form of energy but the only energy that can activate the special chlorophyll molecule and you see here this is in the middle in the middle of pigments island here this special pigments molecule is actually chlorophyll a but with a loose electron meaning that the electron can be ejected out so when it says here p680 p680 this actually referring to the nanometer nanometer of light that will enable the electron in this loose chlorophyll a molecule to be ejected out to become excited and then proceed um, through the electron transport change uh, one thing about light is you need to understand there are many nanometer of light okay so light we usually uh, denote as lambda it can be from zero until whatever um, nanometer but the one that you are interested in is for photosynthesis is between 400 nanometer to 700 nanometer right and this nanometer it, even though it has a value it can be in uh, perceived by your retina at the back of your eyes so 400 nanometer this is the wavelength the lambda where when this is detected by your eyes it will appear blue on the other hand for 700 nanometer when this is detected by your retina your photoreceptor in your retina this will appear as red okay you can see that 400 nanometer less in number but high in energy this is the rule that you need to understand now is because it's it's kind of opposite the shorter the nanometer the higher the energy but the longer the, na the nanometer the lower the energy it's kind of go the opposite way so imagine when the light comes here for example maybe it comes in the 400 nanometer this 400 nanometer is won't be able to activate this reaction center because Ration center needs 680 nanometer. So what happened? So through the resonance energy, resonance energy, the the pigments that absorb the 400 nanometer here will vibrate and it's transfer the vibration to the pigments next to it. During this transfer, some energy is lost. So the second molecule will have less energy than the original 400 nanometer so the second molecule will have perhaps 450 nanometer and then it transfer again it becomes 500 nanometer then it transfer again you got 550 550 still cannot activate this guy why this number is increasing because the longer the wavelength, the lesser of the energy. Why the energy is lesser? Because that is the law. Whenever um, energy is transferred from one medium to another uh, medium, the energy is lost. Yeah. Think of it like the tuning fork. You know, remember when you learn in your physics in school? The 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 I don't know how to, to draw it. The tuning fork, this thing. When, when this thing you bang it um, on the uh, on the edge of your bench or table this thing is going to vibrate violently right when you touch the pawn you, you got your pawn here when you touch a pawn your pawn will start to produce ripple right yeah but when you touch the second point the ripples is going to be a lot smaller than the first one why because there is a transfer of energy here when they transfer the first one will have more energy than the second one so that's what happens here 
So the energy trans gets transferred here, become lesser and lesser. This guy 600 and then takes 670. Six, uh, See, takes 670, right? Then the moment it arrives here, 680, then the electron eject gets ejected out. It becomes excited. That excited electron won't stay excited forever. Okay, it will return back to the ground state. But instead of return back to the um, chlorophyll in the reaction center, it is passed to the electron acceptor. So all the blue guys here, they are another kind of proteins in this region here. So these proteins are called the electron acceptor. Uh, they are pheophytin, quinone A, quinone B, plastoquinone, cytochrome B6F, plastocyanin, and then they enter another region, which is the photosystem 1 region. So you see, during this transfer, the energy gets lesser and lesser as it's progressing down. That's why the moment it arrives in the photosystem 1 region, the energy here becomes 700. Okay. And coincidentally, 700 nanometer, which is slightly the deeper red, 680 is red. Not red, red. 700 is also red, but 700 nanometer is a deeper red compared to 618 nanometer. Another electron excitation will happen and then it will be passed to the electron acceptor, pretty much like the electron acceptor here, uh, to the iron sulfur protein, to the ferrodopsin, and eventually to the end of the terminal molecule, which is an ADPH. This guy here, this guy here, you can see, is actually no longer in the telecom membrane. You see, all this time we are talking about here, this, they are in the telecom membrane. The end of the molecule here, the NADP here, is actually already in the stroma region. The moment NADP received uh, electron in the form of hydrogen, it becomes NADPH. Okay, why? Because whatever that originates from here, now in its body, okay, this thing has been reduced to become an NADPH. Okay, so this is the product of light reaction and ADPH. Okay, what about um, uh, ATP? You see, ATP during the movement of electron down the uh, uh, cascade uh, of electron acceptor here. Can you see the hydrogen in the stroma region? There's a hydrogen here, there's a hydrogen here, there's a hydrogen here. You see, the hydrogen here can actually be transferred into the lumen inside the thylakoid membrane. Transferred by whom? Transferred by the this electron acceptor. This electron acceptor, they have faces that facing the stroma. The moment they have been triggered by electron that's coming down the cascade of reaction here, they scoop in the hydrogen from the stroma and then they bring in the hydrogen into the lumen. Therefore, the brighter the light that you give to your plant, the more electron will go down this electron acceptor transport chain here and therefore the more hydrogen will be jammed into the lumen region. Eventually, what will happen is you will have an imbalance of hydrogen. You have more hydrogen in the lumen compared to the hydrogen in the outside of, uh, of the lumen that is in the stroma. So, nature does not need imbalances. So the hydrogen will, we'll use the second diagram here, the hydrogen that is present now, a lot in the thylakoid, 
cannot exit in using this route, cannot exit using this route, cannot exit using this route, except it can exit through a special tunnel here, through this protein. This protein is called ATP synthase. ATP synthase has a tunnel. You can see the tunnel. Let me draw you your imaginary tunnel here. So the hydrogen will get in here because it needs to balance the hydrogen. The that's the chemical osmosis. While the hydrogen is rushing out of the lumen into the stromal side of it, you see ATP synthase got this head here. That's called the rotor head. And this rotor head already have two molecules, the ADP, adenosine diphosphate, and also so the um, inorganic phosphate. The I stands for inorganic. The moment the hydrogen exit this ATP synthase, this rotor head will turn. What happens when it turns? When it turns, it's going to jam the ADP with the inorganic phosphate, and then that's how you get your ATP. Yeah, that's how you get your ATP. Yeah, so you can imagine the brighter your light, the more electron going through the electron transport chain, the more hydrogen is pumped into the lumen, the more hydrogen will exit, the faster the rotor head will turn, the more ATP will be produced. Yeah, so that's how you get your NADPH and also ATP for your light reactions. Okay, what about oxygen? There's another guy here. Oxygen is here. Uh, remember, the moment the moment um, the reaction center electron is ejected out, the electron didn't return right. So this leaving a hole in here. Literally, there is a hole. Yeah, that hole needs to be filled in. That electron is not coming back. So what happens is. In the lumen, there's so much water because this is all liquid. The water is forced to split in order to fill in the hole from the excitation of electron in the reaction center. And when this happens, the water is split. That's how the hydrogen is lost. That's how you get your oxygen. And this process is called photolysis photo because because of light lysis lysis uh means uh to to, uh, to break it breaks uh, the, the water literally it breaks the water it is it's a super strong if you think about it can you break water no matter how sharp your knife is you're not going to be able to break water can you but this thing is happening like as easy as cutting through a jelly so very easy yeah, so that's how you get your oxygen. Okay, so now you know where you get your ATP, your NADPH, and also your um, oxygen. Right, right. So I put I put um, the uh, summary for the first reaction here. Please do not forget this. Okay, ATP is to phosphorylate. ATP can be added to any molecule. The moment ATP is added to any molecule, that process is called phosphorylation. What about NADPH? NADPH. You see, this hydrogen can be donated to other molecules as well. So, that molecule, the moment it receives the hydrogen, hydrogen, it will be called as reduced. Right, okay. Now, let's look at the second part of the photosynthesis, which is the Kelvin cycle or the light independent reaction. You see, Kelvin cycle, the name is cycle, means that it needs energy. Where on earth does it get the energy? From the light reaction, you see, you got your ATP. You got an ADPH. These two molecules are the one that drive the carbon cycle to, 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 to do its cycling job. Okay, so let's let's have a look. 
So what happens that exactly? So Kelvin cycle, you need to know, has three um, phases. The phase one is called the carbon fixation. Phase two is called the reduction. Phase three is called the regeneration. At the beginning of the cycle, this is when the Rubisco, the, the famous enzyme that I mentioned uh, earlier, will jam in or combine uh, CO2 molecules, CO2, and also the 5-carbon sugar, the RUBP. Rubisco, the name is like this. The full name is Rebulose Bis Phosphate Carboxylase Oxygenase. Oxygenase. <laughs> right. When, when I have written in such a way this way, that means you are expected to remember this until forever. Right. So Rubisco is the enzyme that catalyzes the reaction. So with this reaction, you are getting um, the first uh, precursor molecule that is called PGA, phosphoglyceric acid. Phosphoglyceric acid. Yeah. The thing is, phosphoglyceric acid is not really a sugar precursor. Okay, this will undergo phosphorylation. It will be phosphorylated, meaning that phosphate, this P here, is added to it. Okay, the moment it has been added with phosphorylate, phosphorylation uh, molecule, that is the ATP, uh, it will then undergo reduction. Okay, so during reduction, it will receive hydrogen from an ADPH molecule. Yeah, at the end of this uh, carbon fixation and then reduction, you will get GA3P. And this is your sugar precursor. This is why it is important to understand the light reaction first because without ATP, without an ADPH, you are not going to get your GA3P, your glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate. Why, how, where does it get the phosphate? From the ATP, right? So, one GA3P is three carbon molecule, three carbon. If you times two, you are going to get glucose. And that's how you get your glucose, okay? However, if you follow this entire biochemical reaction, only one molecule of uh, GA3P exits. The other five actually, they don't exit. They continue the cycle to undergo the regeneration. So with the help of another molecules of ATP, this uh, glycerol dehydrate phosphate will be rearranged so that they can be turned into RUBP. So why, why, why plants do it this way? Why, why it has to be in this form of cycle? Why it cannot be like one reaction? A plus B, you get C because it's more sustainable, it's more efficient in the form of cycle. If suddenly the plant is out of RUBP because everything is linear, how, how it can ensure that the production of sugar is not halted? The plant needs the sugar all the time because it needs to transport it throughout the day um, to the sink organ. So this is the the more sustainable and the more efficient way for the plants to deal with it, right? Okay, so that is the Kelvin cycle. So what's the product of Kelvin cycle? G3P. Uh, this thing got many symbols, okay? I mind you that. In, in this uh, note, it's called GA3P. So it can be called GA3P, it can 
be called G3P, it can be called triose phosphate. Triose phosphate, they are all the same thing. Tri, tri means three, three carbon sugar. G3P, three carbon sugar. Glyceraldehyde, three carbon sugar. You see, they're all three carbon sugar. So there are synonyms. Right. It's just the same thing it's like to confuse us. All right. Well, they, they, they might confuse you. Uh, I, I come kind of used to it. Right. So what about the consideration? So for the photosynthesis to happen, you can see that you know that the the light is an ingredient and also the, the molecule that, that uh, energize the whole thing. You can see that as the light increase, your rate of photosynthesis will increase. But at certain point, it will start to plateau. Why? If your light increase, but your CO2 is not increasing, able to do lots of light reaction, but they are not able to do the Kelvin cycle properly, right? Okay. So then why can we just increase the CO2 concentration? Yeah, you can increase the CO2 concentration, but eventually you're going to get the similar curve as the first one, you see? But the first one is, is rather sharp here. Can you see here? So this curve is called the bi, oh my goodness, biphasic curve. Biphasic curve. So you've got, you got the two phases here. The first phase, the second phase. The first phase, the second phase. I'm not going to go into detail into what, what it means. This is for the more advanced class. But it's good for you to know that any chemical reaction will have this kind of pattern. Okay? So um, why the rate of photosynthesis is not increasing? while you have increased the CO2. Well, if you want to further increase it, you need to increase the light now. But is it possible to increase everything indefinitely, increasing the CO2, increasing the uh, light? It's just not possible, right? Even if you grow your plants um, in the plant factory, in the protected environment, it's just not possible. So when it comes to the economic value of it, scientists need to determine how the plants can be happy with the minimum uh, ingredients of photosynthesis given. Yeah, you give it here, you give it here, you are just going to get as just as good if you give it here, if you give it here. Because in agriculture, this is all costing, right? If you want to increase your light in your plant factory up to this point, you need more wattage and, and that is money. If you want to increase your CO2 up to this point, this means that you need to produce to give small CO2. This is money as well. So why increase if the economic return that you're going to get just as similar as this point here? So that's the consideration that people need to give. Yeah, what about the temperature? You see temperature because um, whatever that you have seen earlier in all the complexity of this, these are all protein, okay? So protein, they can't really function when the temperature is too low this region here so because temperature heat is energy right as you increase the temperature your protein is going to become more active exponential then it will reach its optimum max here but if you further increase the temperature it will drop abruptly here yeah, to the point it's no longer functioning. And this is the protein denaturation. Denaturation. Yeah. Yeah. To, it's, it's kind of like when you're boiling eggs. Okay. Tap water, temperature water. Your egg is not boiling. It's still liquid in there until tomorrow. Nothing's going to happen. But if you, when you increase the temperature of your boil, your eggs, the water in which your egg is in, eventually your egg is going to solidify, harden, then you come out with a boiled egg, right? So the boiled egg is actually denatured protein. Can you reverse the boiled egg to become liquid egg again? The solidified egg, you can't, right? So that what, that's what happens in plant. That, this is why global warming is very, very detrimental to plants. 
if it can it if the plants gets too heated too hot much of the protein not only photosynthesis protein protein in the respiration proteins in the hormone signaling all gets denatured to the point the damage is irreversible it has to become the boiled egg it cannot be reversed right yeah so the final uh, uh graph here is just to put into perception how are you going to increase your rate of photosynthesis with the intensity of light? You can, like I said, if you increase your high CO2 as well. Yeah. Yeah. But again, whether you want to increase high CO2 or not, that depends on the uh, economic value that you are getting in. Right. Okay. And finally, the thing that you need to know is the modes of photosynthesis. All this while, what you learn is called the C3 photosynthesis. Why is it C3? Because the first carbon product, the first carbon product that exits the Kelvin cycle at the end of the reduction phase of it is the GA3P, this thing here. And this thing is three carbon. This is why this is called the C3 photosynthesis. I think over over 70%, 80% of the plants on the planet do this kind of photosynthesis. You get another two kind of photosynthesis. It's called the C4 photosynthesis and the CAM photosynthesis. So how do they differ? They differ in the first carbon that exits uh, in the uh, in, in the in, in their photosynthetic uh, system. In the case of C4 photosynthesis, like the one that happens in corn, you can see here, the photosynthesis is happening in two cells. Yeah. Unlike in C3 plants, the carbon, carbon, oops, carbon fixation and carbon um, assimilation happens all within one cell but for the C4 photosynthesis it's not happening everything in one cell it happens in two cells in the first cells so this is um, just to give you a perspective this is a cross-section of a leaf because you've got your stomata here in the first cell that is the mesophy cell um, this is what we call as the CCM, carbon concent concentrating mechanism. So the plants decide to concentrate the carbon first in the form of four carbon compounds. Okay, meaning that all this Kelvin cycle is just not happening. They they just want to 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 jam um, the, the the cell with the four carbon compound. Why? The reason is because of Rubisco. Remember Rubisco, ribulose, bisphosphate, carboxylase, oxygenase. Meaning that Rubisco is an ancient enzyme. If you remember from your school time when you learn about enzyme. The activity is very specific, correct? You've got lock, you've got one key. One key opens one lock. So that's your regular definition of uh, uh, enzyme activity. But for Rubisco, that's not happening. It's like having two keys for one lock. So meaning that Rubisco can catalyze two biochemical reactions. It can be the carboxylase reaction or the oxygenation reaction. If it proceeds with carboxylase reaction or carboxylation reaction, good, you got your sugar. This is what we want. But if it proceeds with oxygenation, you are not going to get your sugar. But you used up, you use up ATP. 
So it's, it's, it's actually a metabolically wasteful process. The thing with Rubisco, it's an ancient enzyme, meaning that there are bound to be some oxygenation anyway that happens during the day. It's true that you get your, your, your plants to grow and everything, but it's not, that's not efficient for the C3 plant. Okay? So for C4 plant, they have evolved. That's the word. They have evolved. They jam the Rubisco with CO2 so that the Rubisco is deaf to oxygen and only do the carboxylation reaction. How they do it? They fix the carbon first uh, using this enzyme, phosphoenol pyruvate carboxylase, and then they got the first product of it is a four carbon product. It can be malate or aspartate. This malate and aspartate will move to the second cell and the, the second cell, which is the bundle shift cell, is the cell that actually does the Kelvin cycle. So in this cell, this malate and aspartate will undergo decarboxylation, meaning that they release the uh, CO2 so that the Rubisco is being surrounded purely by CO2, no oxygen. Yeah. When this happens, you get completely sugar production and stop oxygenation reaction from happening. By the way, at the end of this slide, you will see during your cell revision, if the Rubisco proceed uh, to the oxygenation reaction, you will get photorespiration. This is the name of the process, photorespiration. Remember, okay, in agriculture, we don't want photorespiration a lot because it's metabolically wasteful. It uses ATP but it's, it doesn't produce sugar, right? So, yeah, so that's why it's called C4 because malate and aspartate is for carbon. How about the CAM photosynthesis? CAM is actually short for uh, crassulation acid. My, my pen is actually a bit wiggling. Acid metabolism. Um, if the uh, C4 plants have two cells to separate between the carbon fixation and then the Kelvin cycle process, the CAM plant, they do it in such a way, um, it's still in one cell, not two cell, but they separate uh, by time. So this separation happens by spatially, meaning that by space, special separation. This is separation by time, temporal separation. So during the night time, the stomata will open so much to allow CO2 to get in. The moment the CO2 get in, it will be fixed, uh, it will dissolve and then it will be fixed into the four carbon compound here, which is the mallet. Yeah, and during the day, the stomata will close, meaning that no, no more CO2 uh, uh, going in. During the day, this malate will undergo decarboxylation so that the Rubisco again will become deaf to oxygen, but only listen to CO2 to proceed with carboxylation ration. So it kind of working 24 hours for this guy. During the day, it does photosynthesis as usual, as this guy, as this guy. But during the night, it's doing the carbon fixation. Yeah, all the time. So that's why we call it, it's um, separated temporarily by time. And for the C4 photosynthesis, the carbon fixation is separated by space, which is two cells, this of your cell and the shield cell. We call it by spatial uh, uh, separation. Right, okay? One hour. Yeah, I managed to finish this in one hour. I kept, I kept saying, uh, telling myself, can I finish this in one hour? Because I, I come, I, I can be very busy when it comes to photosynthesis because that's my specialty. Right, okay. Uh, so from my side of teaching you when it comes to photosynthesis, that's all. 
So what you need to do now is, you need to do the revision, right? For the rest of the slide, you're going to see that all these in the written form, you like all these in the, in the point form, right? So read this again so that you can understand the lesson better, right? For example, uh, I didn't, for the C4 plans, I didn't uh, give you this right. The, the, this cross section, yeah, in the revision notes, you go, you're going to get this, right? Okay, um, and eventually you'll get, you'll be presented with the photo respiration. I think photo respiration should be at the end. Yep, right there, the story of the photo respiration. Right. Okay, so um, I think that's all from me. Um, uh, later, the the, the, the uh, my, my my student will will give you the link for my previous lesson if you want to watch. Uh, all all I put it in the in the playlist. Okay, I think you can use my playlist though. Just search. You need to um, go the into the uh, sends me a comfort. Then you can search. There's a little search box, right? Just type in photosynthesis. Then you're going to get all my endless videos about photosynthesis. Right. Okay. Right. Okay. I think that's all for me for now. Um, any question? So far, no, doctor. <clears throat> yeah. What about the people? All good. There's no class tomorrow. Okay. I give you time to do this revision and also to finish up your experiment. Okay, uh, we uh, I think we have collected your 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 submission. Anybody want to do submission anymore this week? Or are you done? I I suggest you do do not. Do, uh, what was this? Is, what is she saying? Your brain is not braining halfway the class. Why? Why? What's wrong? Is there something I need to know? What do you mean? Your your brain is not braining. Is that some kind of your urban new age kind of language? Mm, is it like uh, Gen Z slang? Means yeah. Like, it's too, too much mean? information to consume. <laughs> mm. I told you right. I control myself when it comes to photosynthesis. And you already think this is this is too much. <laughs> Do not to worry. This is why I, I designed the uh, the lesson into two parts. See, do revision. If you do not know how to do revision because you are too much branding happening, see, I put a little advice to you. You see, I'm very considerate. What you need to do? You need to find grapes. You need to eat grapes. And then you need to find the, uh, what's that thing? Yeah, blindfold. You need to sleep as well. So I'll do all these things so that you can do all this revision. Okay? Okay, doctor. Thank you, doctor. Thank you. Okay, right. doctor. <laughs> All right. Okay. Any any question? I know it's 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 nine now. Um, I can take extra five ten minutes. All good. All good. Yep. All good. All okay, good. Um, kind of. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um. Not to worry. You're going to see me again. Uh. Next Monday. Right. Okay. Yes. Um, right. Okay. So I'm going to leave to you just to this. Uh, please do your revision and then do your um, lab as well. Um, I, I'm not around actually until um, Sunday, even if you have submitted um, tomorrow until Friday, nobody is going to pick it up. Maybe if you want to submit any, anything, start resubmitting again next week. Okay, starting Monday, because I'm afraid it might it might got lost because uh, on Thursday, the auditor, the ISO people going to visit the lab is going to get very busy. I don't want them to think your submission is documents and then they take the document away back to their offices. Right. Okay. Right. Okay. Okay. I think that's all. Uh, uh, there's not nothing else. Um, Happy dreaming. I'll see you again. Bye.
Bye. Thank you, Doctor. Have Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, Doctor. Good night. 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 Good night